Inform Choice Radio, episode 315, Beyond the 4% Rule. Live Live. from Sundial House Studios, this is Informed Choice Radio. Radio. Want to make the most of your money and your life? You've You've come come to to the the right right place. place. Now, here's your host, host. Martin Bamford. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Informed Choice Radio. In this episode, I'm joined by Abraham Okasana, author of a new book called Beyond the 4% Rule, The Science of Retirement Portfolios That Last a Lifetime. There's also a roundup of the latest personal finance news and the after show segment too. If you're new here, a very warm welcome to this podcast. I'm Martin Bamford, your host. I'm a chartered financial planner, fellow of the Personal Finance Society and a personal finance author. This is a podcast from Informed Choice. We're an award-winning firm of chartered financial planners in Cranley in Surrey. Here at Informed Choice, we help you to achieve your financial goals in life and make those all-important decisions with confidence. And that's what this podcast, Informed Choice Radio, is all about. You can find out more about the podcast, you can listen to our entire back catalogue of more than 300 episodes, and you can find the show notes for this episode at icradio.co.uk slash 315. Before my conversation with Abraham, here's a roundup of the latest personal finance news. The proposed ban on pension cold calling might come into force in June, following a government amendment to the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill. The new clause would introduce a ban on pensions cold calling by June. The cold calling ban was recommended by the Work and Pensions Committee in its Protecting Pensions Against Scams report following a campaign led by IFAs. The Work and Pensions Committee chairman, Frank Field MP, said, I am delighted that they will be bringing forward a ban on pensions cold calling by June as we called for. This represents a major leap forward in the urgent fight to protect pensioners' savings against scams and sharp pack practice. International Women's Day is a call to action to make further progress towards gender equality. While much progress has been made, more work needs to be done to improve the financial resilience of women in Britain today. That's according to the insurer Royal London, who have put together a five-point plan to improving women's long-term financial position. The plan says women should claim what is due to you, get saving, start investing, don't rely on others and get advice where you can. Helen Morrissey, personal finance specialist at Royal London, said initiatives like auto-enrolment will help women improve their financial resilience, but there is more that can be done. For instance, we need greater awareness of the benefits available to help new mums accumulate national insurance credits towards their state pension entitlement, and we must encourage more long-term savings and investment behaviours. Once these behaviours become ingrained, we will see more women building a sustainable financial future. Chancellor Philip Hammond is expected to reveal an £11 billion improvement to public finances during his spring statement next Tuesday. Analysis of official figures by the Resolution Foundation think tank have found improving productivity and higher tax revenues contributing to the improvements. It would demonstrate a stark contrast to the gloomy picture painted by the Office for Budget Responsibility during the autumn statement, autumn budget, sorry, in November. The Resolution Foundation expects the deficit to undershoot the OBR forecast of it reaching £49.9 billion this year, up from £45.7 billion in the previous 12 months. UK house price growth slowed to 1.8% in February, according to the latest survey from the lender Halifax. It represents the slowest rate of annual house price growth recorded since March 2013. Prices rose by 0.4% in February on a month-by-month basis, following two consecutive months of declines. The average price of a UK home now stands at £224,353, down from £226,408 in November. Russell Galley, Managing Director of the Halifax, said the labour market continues to perform strongly, with the number of people in employment rising by 88,000 in the three months to December. While we expect price growth to remain low, the low mortgage rate environment, combined with an ongoing shortage of properties for sale, should continue to support house prices over the coming months. Energy regulator Ofgem is proposing new rules which would result in £5 billion of savings for energy customers during the next five years. The regulator wants to reduce the amount consumers contribute towards investment in energy networks. It estimates households would save £15 to £25 a year as a result. Proposed price controls would come into force in 2021, having a direct impact on the profitability of energy network companies. 
energy giant National Grid said in response to the proposals that it would continue to work with Ofgem to achieve the best outcome for all stakeholders. In a statement, National Grid said, We note the wide range of options the consultation document contains and acknowledge the focus on long-term thinking for critical infrastructure, incentive outperformance opportunities for well-run companies and the continuing alignment of consumer and shareholder interests. In this episode of Informed Choice Radio, I'm very pleased to welcome back my friend Abraham Okasana. Regular and loyal listeners to the podcast will remember Abraham from episode 11 all the way back in February 2015. And more recently, he came back on the podcast in episode 114. That was September 2016, when we spoke about what he calls brainless portfolios. Abraham is hosting a conference in London next week. It's called The Science of Retirement. And he's just published a new book called Beyond the 4% Rule, The Science of Retirement Portfolios That Last a Lifetime. Now, before I share our conversation with you, here's a blurb from the book to give you some context. Retirement income planning used to be so simple. Most people never had to worry about how to convert their retirement savings into income for the rest of their lives. Today's low annuity rates, closure of increasing numbers of defined benefit schemes and the pension freedoms introduced by the UK government in 2015 ripped up the retirement income planning rulebook. The book confronts the challenge of how to secure a sustainable income that lasts a lifetime from your portfolio. It delves into the detail of the various withdrawal strategies, asset allocation and the unavoidable question of how long before you pop your clogs. This book helps retirees and their advisors navigate the treacherous retirement income landscape using sound empirical evidence and practical application. Now, the reason I wanted to chat to Abraham about his book was because we often refer to this thing called the 4% rule. And I think it's become one of those throwaway financial rules of thumb, often mentioned without really digging into many of the details. As Abraham will explain in just a moment, the rule is based on some really robust science, but there is a lot more to consider for individuals, in particular, the impacts of fees, the underlying asset allocation used and the assumption that retirement income will stay the same at the same level for the rest of life. And spoiler alert here, it doesn't. So here's my conversation with Abraham Okasana. Well, welcome back to Informed Choice Radio. I'm joined now by Abraham Okasana. Abraham, you've been on the podcast before, but welcome back. Perhaps for anyone that hasn't heard you before on the podcast, could you start by just briefly introducing yourself and telling us a bit about what it is you do? Yes, thanks for having me, um, Martin, and, and thanks for the incredible work you do with the podcast. Um, yeah, so I, I am Abraham and I run a research um, consultancy firm, firm called Finalytics. So we're essentially I'm a research firm. We provide investment and retirement consultancy to to financial advisor and our uh, we, we recently a software into the marketplace called the Timeline app, which is a web-based um, application for advisors um, looking to um, help client work out, um, you know, the sustainability of their income in retirement. Fantastic. I actually had a financial planner come to my offices yesterday and we went into the meeting room and he saw your timeline poster with the various sort of returns and drawdowns and things. Right. But he got very excited when he saw that. So he recognized it straight away and realized it was something from you. But it's, it's great. It's a great app and great work. Now, the reason we're chatting today is you've written a book. You've written a book called Beyond the 4% Rule, the science of retirement portfolios that yes. last a lifetime. So perhaps, yeah. perhaps we can start with the basics. Well, well done on writing the book firstly, but what is the 4% rule? for anyone that's not familiar with that term. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Martin. So so the 4% rule is, is a rule that came out of the, the US um, and, and it's designed to guide people um, around how much they can take from their retirement um, portfolio. So say, for instance, you have a portfolio of um, 100,000 pounds. The 4% rule says um, you can take Four thousand pounds from that portfolio, and then adjust that four thousand pounds in line with inflation every single year, regardless of what's going on in your portfolio. And that portfolio would last you thirty years in the very worst case scenario. So the idea is that it, 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 it's a rule to, to 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 guide people for how much they can take from their portfolio. The rule was originally invented by a guy called Bill Bengen. And Bill was a, a financial advisor. Well, actually, he was an aeronautic engineer who became a financial planner 
and and he, he, he created the framework ba based um, on on a U.S. Um, investor um, in, in 1994. Mm. And I guess the easy way of looking at the four percent rule is to say if you choose the amount of income you want in retirement, you divide that by four percent, and that then becomes the pot of money you need to sustain that income level. <coughs> That's correct, yes. Yeah. Now, I know there's been some challenges to that 4% rule in recent years. So tell us about how you've approached it. You've talked, talked about the book being beyond the 4% rule. So how do you go beyond that rule? Well, let's start, first of all, uh, Martin. Um, one thing I've come to recognize about the 4% rule is that actually only 4% of people understand it, right? <laughs> okay, yep. um, because there are so many misconceptions around the rule. Some people think of it as, well, taking 4% of your portfolio each year. That's not what the rule says. Mm. Um, I, I think that, you know, having, having studied this extensively, let's not take away from the work that Bill Bengen did. I think it's an incredible piece of work. But there are some shortcomings, and it's those shortcomings that we need to address. So, so for instance, the rule was created based on some assumptions in terms of, A, it does ignore fees, i.e. The, the impact of fees on your, on your portfolio. Hmm. B, um, it, 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 it's the, the underlying asset allocation is based on U.S., equities and U.S. bonds. So the idea is that you invest 50% of your portfolio in U.S. equities and U.S. bonds. Um, the assumption is also that a retiree is going to spend, um, you know, a, a given amount of money in real terms for the rest of their retirement. Mm. All of those assumptions, um, if you change anything about those assumptions, then you don't get 4%. So, for instance, if you take into account the, the, the impact of fees, um, if you change, have a different asset allocation, or, or if you look at this from a, a perspective of a UK investor, i.e. if you take into account UK inflationary environment into account, you, you, you don't get 4%. Now, this is a point that, that Be Bill Bengen made in his paper. Mm. But of course, a lot of people ignore that um, and they hang on to the 4% rule as though it's some, um, you know, some, you know, Newton's fourth law of motion, um, you know, that, that is um, I invincible. Of course, it's not. Um, it's it, it, it a robust framework, but we need to adapt it to to the context of each client and each individual sitting in front of us. So would you advocate for an individual rule rather than for a broad rule? So I know some of the recent research suggests it's not really 4%, it should be 3.5% or 3%. But are you saying that actually each individual investor needs to have their own percentage based on, on their own circumstances? Uh, absolutely. freaking lutely Can I say that? You this? certainly can, yeah. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. This is why, I mean, this is... You know, uh, uh, th this is why I, I, I created the software, the, the timeline app, which is designed to, to enable advisor to create a personalized withdrawal strategy for each client. Mm. It, you, you should check it out. It's a great software. No, I'll stop blowing smoke off my own ass <laughs> right now. And yeah, yeah, obviously, everyone needs to have their own personalized withdrawal strategy. Um, the, the framework is very, very useful, but we need to be in a position where we can adapt that to each person is sitting in front of us. So, for instance, we can take into account their own specific asset allocation that we're recommending for, for, for them or, or look at the impact of different asset allocation. Um, we, we can take a, in, into account their own time horizon. So, for instance, if, if, if the, the typical assumption of 30, 30 years doesn't hold up for everyone. So, mm. for instance, if you have somebody who is um, 60, for instance, well, you might need to plan slightly longer than 30 years. Or if you have someone who is 60, you know, 68, then you might need to plan slightly less than 30 years. So, so we need to take into so a different time horizon, we need to take into account the impact of fees um, coming out of the portfolio. 
Um, and of course, more important, let's not forget the 4% rule is based on the very worst historical scenarios, um, you know, for, for a U.S. investor. So the mm. idea is what Bill Bengen did was to look at every ruling 30-year period um, since 1926 and then to say the very worst case scenario will be that you could take 4% and you wouldn't run out of money in the very worst case scenario. But I think that's actually a very pessimistic view of the world um, in the sense that, um, I mean, the, the data that we use goes back 1900. And so within that data set, you have some really, really horrific historical scenarios mm. like World War One, World War II, Great Depression of you know, 19, you know, 1929, very, very bad scenarios. And so it's useful to stress test your portfolio based on this or your withdrawal strategy based on this. But I don't believe that you necessarily need to be planning for the very, very worst case scenario. Maybe we should be, you know, the, 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 we, we should be aiming for, um, you know, a, a strategy that will, will survive 90% of times as opposed to 100% of times. So we ignore the, the some of the very, very extreme market conditions. And one final point before I shut up is that, again, the, the, the Bengen's research is based on that static assumption of um, you're going to spend a, the same amount of money in real terms when you're when you know when you're 85 as you did when you're 65. Mm -hmm. Again, that that just doesn't hold up to 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 um, what what goes on in people's lives. So again, we can ad adopt the rule, um, you know, depending on the, the expectation of the individual sitting in front of us. Well, I wanted to ask you about that, about spending assumptions in retirement, because there's this um, this concept of a U-shaped retirement spending pattern, isn't there? Is that something you support where people spend more in the early stage of retirement, less in the middle stage, and then a lot more at the end when they maybe need care fees? Is that, is that a real shape of retirement spending? No, it's not. Um, so there, there's a re and again, this is one thing that I covered in my book. Um, there, there's been several different research around this. I will start from um, one that is UK based. So UK, um, the, the International Longevity Institute, they looked at this. They looked at two very large databases and they looked at the typical spending pattern in retirement. They did not find a U-shaped pattern. They broke people into different categories, five different categories based on their lifestyle. So they looked at um, you know, transport lovers, or extra vegan couples. Now, I didn't come up with these terms. They did. <laughs> um, I, I doubt very much that any retiree describes themselves this way. But of course, researchers have to make a living. So they came up with this, you know, these profiles. But the point is that regardless of, you know, the, the, the different kind of categories of people they looked at, they did the U-shaped spending. There's been several different research in the U.S., one notably by Monin as um, head of retirement research, a chap called David Blanchett. Um, again, looking at actual spending pattern in retirement, they did not find a U-shaped spending pattern. Mm -hmm. There's been some research in, in Australia, again, on the same framework. They did not find U-shaped spending. This is something that we invented. You know, it, it's a child, it's a figment of our imagination in financial services. It does not exist. People spend progressively less as they get older mm -hmm. um, in real terms. Now, of course, the, there are the, the, there are um, some expenses um, in later life um, that that we need to think about. So, for instance, if someone has to go into care, um, then of course you know that that needs to be funded. But the, the fundamental thing to bear in mind is that first of all, um, that only happens to something like one in eight people. So it's not typical. Second of all, the, the typical number of years that people spend in care rooms before they die, um, sadly, is, is two years. Mm. Um, and a vast majority of them um, only spend four years in, in care. So, so the, the idea then that we should essentially plan a U-shaped pattern for everyone does not hold up. 
And um, finally, we should be thinking of that of that care cost um, as a lump sum expenditure r rather than rather than um, one that we um, base the spending pattern in retirement mm. on. Yeah, I'm very much on board with that. I mean, typically where we see clients go into care, it does require the sale of a property to fund you know, two right. to four years of care. So that, that right. makes real sense. I guess what, what we're talking about here about the likelihood of you know, going into care, the likelihood of income patterns changing, the likelihood and probability of market events, this comes down to something you cover in the book um, around two different retirement income philosophies so probability based or safety yes. first could you talk yes. us talk us through those and, and explain what they mean absolutely absolutely so 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 the way i think of the um you know probability based and safety first idea which again came out of some research done by a child called um professor wade fire wade has done a lot of work on this um in the u.s and and essentially what, what Wade said is that suppose you, again, this is the analogy I used in the book. Um, so suppose you found yourself sitting um, on a bus with two um, retirement eggheads. So these are very clever people. They've done a lot of work on retirement. And so you, you, you can't find a different seat on that bus. So you're, you're stuck on a, on, a, on a bus with them for an hour. Mm. And so you say to them, well, first question is, well, how should I how should I be thinking about my retirement planning? How should I approach it, uh, my, my retirement planning? Well, the safety first guy is going to say to you, well, you need to break your expenses down into two categories. One is the is the um, essential expenses. Think of that as your rice and beans things that you cannot do without. And the other, as your discretionary expenses, things that you can defer, delay, or completely, um, you know, avoid, right? You can do without them, you know, I don't know. Say, say going on holiday, for instance, let, let's just say, right? So then the safety first guy would say, the element of your income that is essential should not be subject to the vagaries of the capital market. It mm. shouldn't be based on a drawdown portfolio. You should secure that using guaranteed income, such as state pension, defined benefit pensions, and annuities. You should not be relying on that, um, you know, on, your, on a portfolio for your essential spending. Mm. Your flexible spending, your discretionary spending, and of course you can rely on a portfolio for that. The, the probability-based lady will say, shut up, you're wasting your time because the future by its very definition is unknown and unknowable and, and most people will consider their retirement a failure if they can only meet their essential expenses but they can't meet their discretionary expenses. Mm. So then that, that distinction between you know, discretionary expenses Right. Ignore that. Just have an idea of um, how much income you need in life, uh, sorry, in, in your retirement, and then rely on the capital market to supply that income. But you have to stress test your portfolio and come at, uh, up with a probability of success. So what are the chances that this is going to um, you know, succeed? And make sure that you have a good chance. So that would typically mean a probability of between 80 to 90 percent. So if you look at all the rolling period in history, use extensive data to stress test that and come up with a reasonable probability of success. Accept that there are risks and you're going to need to make some changes along the way, but do not look for safety where none exists. So obviously, financial planners might fall into one or two camps. They might take that safety first philosophy. They may take the probability based philosophy. Do you think there's a stronger argument for either one of those? Or do you think they're both equally, equally suitable for different people, different clients? No, I, th I think that they're both robust. They both, uh, both have an empirical foundation. So the, the, the safety has to work as its roots in the actuarial industry. Um, the 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 probability based is has its roots in you know in, in the investment industry. Um, you know so so they're they're both 
sound framework. One is generally more expensive than the other. The safety first framework is quite pricey. I, the cost of securing guarantees is, 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 is very high. But, but I think planners need to understand both of them. Um, I, and I think, you know, naively, that adv- clients need to have a broad idea of where they, where they sit. And, um, you know, it, it's the help is the job of the planner what they feel comfortable with because there is just no point if you if you a safety first kind of person um there's just no point um living by the probability based you know framework because you know although it might succeed and you have it with the with the help of a good financial planning planner it, it, it might work the trouble is you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna um, you know, kill yourself, God forbid, mm. w- by just constantly worrying about the, about it because it's just not the right framework for you. So I think everyone needs to understand um, both frameworks and, 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 and where they see it. Abraham, it's been great to chat again today. Um, before you go, firstly, tell me about the annual Science of Retirement Conference you're hosting next week in London. Um, what's, what's the conference all about? Who are some of the speakers you've got coming in? Yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah, so so annual science of retirement conference is something I, I you know you know we started four four years ago and it's just morphed into you know it's it's taking a life of its own. We're expecting over two hundred and fifty delegates in London, um, you know, next week Tuesday, and um, and um, you know we've got an incredible line of speakers. So so what we t- try to do with the science of retirement conference is that you know we we go against you know. What, what is traditionally considered in in the industry. So we go and find, um, you know, people who have scientific um, evidence, robust evidence to back um, their research around retirement. We don't want guesswork. We don't want we don't want to implement strategies just on the say so of a product provider or an asset manager. So we go find professors and PhDs. So so this year we have. David Blanchett, um, you know, um, the Morningstar Head of Retirement um, Research, um, as one of the, the speakers. We have um, a, leg- a legendary, legendary advisor coach, Nick Morey from, mm. from the U.S. And, and uh, you know, uh, just an impressive array of financial planners and, and researchers who are going to be talking about the conference. So I am really excited about it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Fab, any tickets left? No, not really. We shot everything down yesterday, so um, um, unfortunately not. Okay, I'll put a link in the show notes anyway, so maybe people can keep an eye on that for next year. Um, finally then, Abraham, um, where can we buy a copy of the book? When's it out? Yeah, the the, the book is out. Um, I mean, we, we've not formally announced it, so this is going to be the first time people are hearing about it. But yeah, no, the, the book is out. The, obviously, you can find it on, on Amazon, um, and you can get the Kindle version as well, as well as the paper copy. The, but of course, you can, um, you know, d- download a free copy, a free copy of the chapter one of the book on our site, which is beyond 4percent.com, right? So it's beyond number four percent in word.com. Fab. Again, I'll make sure I put a link in the show notes for this episode. And I would recommend people, I've, I've had a read through, I uh, recommend people get hold of that. Whether you're a financial planner or somebody approaching retirement, because I think there's there's great stuff in there for investors to read as well and perhaps take away and challenge their financial planners with to make sure they get the best possible outcome. Abraham, thank you so much for your time today. Martin, thank you for your time and for the incredible work you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, a big, big thank you to Abraham for joining us today for that conversation. I would love to hear your thoughts on this subject. Will you be rethinking some of your retirement planning assumptions as a result of what Abraham had to say? You can leave me a voicemail via our website, that's icradio.co.uk. Email me at martin at icfp.co.uk or get in touch on Twitter at Martin Bamford. I'd love to hear from you. Now, my usual request before I wrap things up for this episode, please do leave us a review on iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Do share this episode with a friend 
friend if you think they might find it useful. And don't forget to subscribe to Informed Choice Radio so you don't miss out on any future episodes. That's all for this episode. I hope it's been useful. Do stay tuned for the after show. It's coming up right after the following music. I share a bit about what we've been up to here at Informed Choice this week. So until next time, I'm Martin Bamford and this is Informed Choice Radio. And remember, when it comes to your money, the more you know, the faster it can grow. Well, hello and welcome back to the After Show from Form Choice Radio, episode 315. This is the part of the episode where I talk about the other stuff, so thank you for sticking with it. Um, so this week, what we've been up to, I spent Monday in the office and then on Monday evening headed up to London for the Chartered Insurance Institute's Insuring Women's Futures Live 2018 event. That was on Tuesday. And I was spending the day working there with the CII, and that was with my Bamford Media hat on, recording some podcast interviews with eight of their speakers, including Dame Inga Beale, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Lloyds of London, and Jane Portis, who's a partner at PwC, also Sharon Sutton, who's the President of the Personal Finance Society. A uh, really, really great event. Fantastic to see a financial services conference and event which was dominated by female attendees. Most of them I go to, it's hard to find women at. Not saying that in a dating way, I'm a married man, but it's very hard to spot women at these events. This one, it was mostly women. In fact, quite a few of the ladies who went to it complained they had to queue for the toilets, which is apparently is quite an unusual experience when they go to these things. Um, so a long day of podcasting on Tuesday. I'm looking forward to sharing all eight episodes next Monday on CII radio and i'll put a link in the show notes if you're interested in hearing more about those subjects around ensuring women's futures otherwise this week i've mostly been in the office it's still getting busier and busier here as the end of the tax year approaches Um, i did make a decision this week and that was to move into my new offices for bamford media a bit earlier than planned so with the kind permission of my landlord i'm allowed access earlier i've actually got access now Um, we're getting lots and lots of interest in this new venture bamford media so i wanted to get into the offices set things up do my decorating get the furniture in get the computer set up and really get our processes established also start looking for our first employee which is much easier when we've got an office that we can show them and say you know when we're interviewing people this is what you where you're going to be working this is what you're going to be doing it means i've got some decorations to do this weekend and it means i placed an absolutely massive order on the ikea website yesterday i'm certainly not going there if it's croydon or southampton because it's a miserable experience going to ikea as anyone that's done it before will know Uh, but i've ordered it online for home delivery and currently procrastinating over the artwork we're going to choose for the office walls so lots of decisions still to make i think we're nearly there now we've got a, a pinterest board we're using to share some ideas also this week i recorded a podcast interview with dr sarah stanley follow sarah is the founder and president of a company called data points and it's a company that provides scientifically validated automated behavioral finance tools to the financial services industry her late father uh, was dr thomas stanley and he was author of a fantastic book a best-selling book called the millionaire next door and sarah's work with data points continues in her father's legacy so do listen out to uh, hear that conversation in just a few weeks time uh, really enjoyed that one some really really good insights in there about the behaviors that make people wealthy and it's stuff you might not expect um, I'm currently reading in terms of books a book called The Startup Playbook founder to founder advice from two startup veterans um, I'm clearly in a startup mindset at the moment there's a few interesting nuggets in this book but it does seem quite US and Silicon Valley centric and also focus on fundraising rather than actually building and publicising the business uh, so a couple of good nuggets in there but not a recommended read necessarily unless you're about to start a startup and uh, raise lots of venture capital uh, coming up next week then looking at my calendar for the week ahead a fairly 
really busy calendar. Uh, we have a strategy planning meeting. I've got various committee meetings. It's the spring statement on Tuesday, which we're not expecting to reveal too many surprises at this point. Certainly no tax changes on the horizon, um, but probably announcing quite a few policy statements and consultations that are about to happen. So uh, listen out next Friday for a, an overview of what happened in the spring statement. And also next week, we have our monthly board meeting. Uh, and plus, of course, building lots and lots of IKEA flat pack furniture so um i'm losing the will to live just reading that line i don't like building flat pack furniture i know it has to be done i'm going to try and rope in some help oh no i guess in, until next time thank you for listening to informed choice radio please consider sharing this episode with a friend and if you've not done so already press that subscribe button we will be back on monday with episode 316 that features an interview with professor victor seidler making sense of brexit <laughs>